Hi, everyone. Thanks, me, Thanks for joining us. We have folks online with us on Zoom and folks in person or like full hell. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Shane Prada. I'm the director here at the Baltimore Jewelry Center. I'm just going to do a quick introduction, then turn it over to Neve. So Neve Coppersmith joined us for their residency from Richmond, Virginia, where in 2022, they received their BFA in Craft and Material Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. Neve's work has been featured in numerous exhibitions at VCU, as well as as well as at New York City Jewelry Week, at Anonymous Brooklyn, at Brooklyn Metalworks, and at Dream Machine. In their work, Nave combines jewelry and metalsmithing techniques with a language of drag performance in order to create wearable sculptures. Both drag and jewelry utilize the body as subject, activating the intimacy inherent in adornment. Nave plays with scale in their work and transforms the human silhouette with the wearable objects they create, challenging the viewer to question what jewelry is and what jewelry is not. During their residency, Neve focused on creating a series of masks, both as a highly necessary and highly politicized artifact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and as an object of adornment to be utilized in drag performance. In Neve's hands, the mask is a drag prosthesis, protecting the wearer while simultaneously creating space for queer expression, performance, and joy. It was really wonderful to have Neve with us this past fall. They were a delightful addition to the studio, a wonderfully kind and caring and edifying community member. We already missed their presence since we haven't had them <laughs> for the past few weeks, but I'm excited for you to hear from them tonight and uh, as they share about themselves as an artist and the work they created during their residency. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for coming to my artist talk. Um, as previously stated, my name is Neve Cropper Smith. Uh, I'm a metal smith based out of Richmond, Virginia. Um, and I'm going to be sharing the culmination of my residency with you all. Uh, I thought I'd start by sharing some of, oh, let me share my screen really quick. Awesome. So, all right. I thought I would start um, by sharing some of the first pieces I made where I was thinking about adornment and masking. Um, so this was a piece I made in my first year of college at VCU. Uh, I had just discovered Nick Cave's down suits, and I was really fascinated by the way he talked about masks and wearable art as a kind of uh, both queer expression and camouflage. Uh, I made this yarn suit, and I got to perform it um, as a final for one of my classes, and this was sort of the, the start of me thinking about adornment and performance. Um, so... I started taking jewelry classes at VCU kind of by accident. And I realized I love I loved metal smithing and art jewelry kind of fit in with this wearable art thing that I was now obsessed with. Um, I made this mask in my intro to jewelry class. And here I was thinking about, again, like gender performance and I was in the process of figuring out my own queerness. Um, so it's kind of an expression of that. And then in the spring of my sophomore year, uh, the novel coronavirus spread to the US and all my classes went online. Uh, and I was in my first jewelry class, uh, sort of post intro. And obviously we didn't have studio access or access to materials. Uh, and I sort of had to look around and um, at sort of what I had in my house at my disposal. And I ended up using a ton of scrap fabric that I had on hand um, to make this suit. Um, and here I'm still thinking about adornment and queerness and performance. Um, and I was I was paying attention to the way that I was dressing myself when it was truly just for myself, when nobody was going to see it but myself and my roommates. And I was doing a lot of writing about it and sort of processing the world through the making of this thing. And I got a little obsessive about it. <laughs> I had this like giant mind map on my wall. I was like that always sunny meme. Anyway, um, and through that, I kept coming back to drag. Um, after making this, I was like, I think I want to do drag and not just be a spectator. Um, so a few months after that, I moved in with three of my friends who are also queer visual artists who are interested in a lot of the same things. Um, Joy West Kemper, Kat Nash, and Margaret Clisham. And we started doing these drag nights together and performing for each other in our house during quarantine and documenting it. Um, and we would transform ourselves and our space 
and we kind of got to escape into this fantasy world um and it was this it became this sort of performance space that we created that was just for us and we could try stuff and be messy and it only existed in our living room and as these kind of like action shots that we would take there's the reason that i'm not including any video of myself performing from this era it was very messy um but uh it was also sort of like an aspirational thing where we were viewing sort of the local drag scene in richmond through social media um as sort of like a light at the end of the tunnel where it was like <laughs> once this is all over uh, and we can go outside again. We can like be a part of this world and this community for real. Um, so, so pretty quick, quickly um, in the next semester, I went back to in-person classes um, for my metal studio classes and craft majors were some of the only classes that weren't online at that point. And it was pretty nerve wracking, um, but also a relief to come back to the studio. And I started making work thinking about my own drag influences. I was thinking through a lot of the sort of mechanics that go into drag and abstracting them into sculptural forms. Uh, I had recently gotten into styling wigs. And here I was thinking about sort of the way that they transform the silhouette and the sort of architecture of how they live on the body, um, but through sort of the lens of metalsmithing. And I started exploring different areas of the body and I started working with steel also. Um, I really enjoyed sort of how quickly I could fabricate with it and how portable it is and how light it is, which with these sort of performance minded pieces felt important to the wearability of them. And here again, thinking about silhouette and shapewear uh, and sort of drastically altering the body and revealing that which is otherwise concealed normally in drag shape where it's all sort of like smoothed over uh, and sort of turning that inside out and highlighting it. Um, and then sort of returning to headpieces. Uh, again, that transformation is happening and now I'm sort of incorporating like uh, alternative materials and fibrous processes. This one is felt and then this one is like cellophane that I melted. Um, and with these, I was thinking about the high heel, um, as a shorthand for femininity and as an icon of like gendered presentation and they actually hinder the wear, like the mobility of the wearer when they're on, uh, when we took this documentation, the model was suspended midair from like a railroad bridge. <laughs> um, and yeah, I got to exhibit these um, at Baltimore or New York City Jewelry Week this last this past year, and that was really exciting. Um, hang on, okay, here we go. And so over the two or ish years um, during which I was making all this work, COVID precautions were starting to be pulled back, and vaccines were rolled out, and masks started to become less and less common. And my friends and I started to perform as up and comers in Richmond drag. And I started to wear some of the pieces I'd made uh, in my numbers, which felt like an important element of what I was trying to do. Uh, one part was obviously the pieces themselves. And then another was activating them. And I started exploring questions of like, where do these pieces live in the world? And what type of performance are they for? Um, trying to so in June of 2022, uh, I performed in this piece uh, in Fallout Fresh Faces, which is kind of the the competition in Richmond for beginner drag performers. And I did pretty well. I was the third runner up and <laughs> it was really fun. It was definitely like the best I'd ever performed for sure. Um, and however, as a result of performing in the show, I contracted COVID for the third time at that point. And it was the second time I'd gotten COVID as a result of performing in drag. And as a result of that, I got diagnosed with long COVID, which manifested as brain fog and fatigue and chronic shortness of breath and memory issues, all of which I'm still dealing with and sort of figuring out the extent of what that's doing to my health. And while I was quarantining that time, 
uh, it was a turning point for me. And I started to come to terms with the reality of what was going on around me. So stay with me here. <laughs> um, so I realized that this model that we've been encouraged to accept for the last few years of catching a novel virus once or twice a year or more is unsustainable. And COVID is still a leading cause of death in the United States. It's been shown to damage every organ system in the body. I started reading studies about the real danger we're facing with each infection being long COVID. Um, and it's a risk that sits around one in 10 infections. And that's not one in 10 people, it's like one in 10 infections even among the vaccinated. Um, COVID remains in the body after infection, even among seemingly mild cases, leading to immunosuppression in previously healthy people. Immunocompromised and disabled people are being put at e an even greater risk. Often we don't immediately feel the effect that it's having on our bodies, um, but unmitigated spread is already manifesting in a drastic overall increase in neurological issues, in cardiac events, in cancers, in diabetes, and strokes. And we're getting sick more frequently and staying sick longer. And um, we're facing this oncoming wave of, of mass disability. And this is all very well documented in peer-reviewed research. Um, however, despite the mountains of evidence sounding the alarm, none of this is being reported really or talked about in very many mainstream media outlets. And the predominant narrative is that COVID is mild and that masks work but aren't required because the pandemic is over. And the amount of misinformation and disinformation propped up by mainstream media is mind boggling at times. Um, but it's also not surprising given that the official guidance for us to go back to normal comes from a vested interest in protecting the economy and not the people. Uh, however, oh, yeah. Um, so the, the temptation to believe that uh, the narrative that we could go back to normal was really overwhelming. And I gave into it for a period of time because I wanted to pursue drag and to perform and to be a part of my queer community. And I, like all of us, had trauma and grief around it. Um, but the fact is we're being put in a massive amount of danger without being informed of the risks. And it's not our fault if we believe that this this propaganda um, and ultimately it is the responsibility of the government and public health to keep us safe. But in times of massive systemic failure like this, we have a responsibility to keep each other safe. So back in 2022, this was a really pivotal moment for me. And at that point, I reprioritized preserving my health and breaking the train of trans transmission as much as I could. Um, coming to terms with this mountain of data and the disparity between that and what we're being led to believe felt really bleak. Um, but there are things that we can do. And I did research on how I could best protect myself and those around me. And I adopted a multi-layered COVID mitigation strategy that has, has been proven to reduce the spread of COVID. I started wearing masks again whenever I shared public air with people. I avoided crowds when possible, and I was selective about going out. Um, there's also like COVID nasal sprays that you can use that will decrease the risk of it like taking hold within your sinuses and air purifiers and also regular testing. Um, but and and most of these mitigations I view as essentially the equivalent of wearing a seatbelt. Um, the risk will never be zero, obviously but that doesn't mean that there aren't simple measures that I can take to reduce the risk in my everyday life. Um, and one decision that I did make that did feel like a big shift is that I stopped performing in drag. And uh, for those of you who may not know, <laughs> the primary style of performing within drag is usually lip sync performance, which is difficult to do while you're wearing a mask. <laughs> and on top of sort of my history of being infected as a result of performing with no mitigation measures, I knew I needed to just take a step back and reevaluate. And I felt like I'd been like stopped in my tracks and I felt disconnected from this community that I had been so I'd been so excited to finally be a part of. And I was grieving like the loss of what could have been and of this thing that was supposed to be propelling me creatively after leaving school. 
and the loss of the idea that things would ever be the same as they had been. Um, and I was afraid of what would happen to my friends in the drag scene who were still performing if they kept getting sick. I felt overwhelmed as more and more COVID data, data was published highlighting the damage being done. And I found it really hard to talk about even with the people I trusted the most because none of us want to think about this. Um, but I couldn't ignore what I was seeing and it paralyzed me and I didn't make anything for a while. Um, and yeah, I worked as a production jeweler for the better part of a year. And I felt like I was slowly reconnecting with the uh, metalsmith thing, even though I still wasn't really making any of my own work. Um, and then that brings me to the start of my residency. So I would love to take a break and move into the hallway and we can do the work. I would love to like talk about what I ended up making. Um, but yeah. Nice. <laughs> that was the downer for it. I promise you. Okay. Moving out. Alrighty. So now we have to talk about what I actually made. Um, <laughs> so I knew that I like needed to make work about this and to try and process it through making. Um, and mask seems like an obvious entry point for me. Uh, I was already interested in the mask as a performance object before COVID masks became sort of massively politicized the way that they have. And I ended up making smaller like maquettes of what will eventually be full scale pieces. And I decided to do that as sort of like a strategy to work through some of the overwhelm that I felt while trying to figure out how to approach this like enormous problem that is so like massive and overwhelming. Um, and yeah, I just need to like set that part of my brain aside and just like start making stuff. Um, so from that, from all of that, I became really interested in the question of like what happens in a drag performance when the mask stays on. Um, and I mentioned earlier that lip sync is the most common type of drag number, but it's by no means the only form. There's so much potential there. Um, there's like vocal performance and dance and movement and performance art and photo and video documentation and digital drag. And um, I wanted to create pieces where the mask is central to the performance and it isn't being compensated and apologized for. And I wanted to create space for like joy within all that really depressing shit that I just talked about. Um, so anyway, uh, obviously I'm thinking about the mask as like adornment and in terms of queer expression and armor. And I'm also thinking about it as like literally as PPE um, as one layer of like COVID mitigation strategy. And while I was constructing these and designing them, um, a big consideration was the way that they couldn't affect like the fit of the actual respirator, like the KN95 or the N95 itself. Um, and I considered the idea of like making jewelry for the mask itself, like that seems like a logical conclusion, but stuff like that tends to sort of weigh down the mask and affect the fit, which obviously affects like the efficacy of what you're going for. Um, and I'm also still really interested in that idea of like transforming the silhouette of the body. So with these, I sort of played around with different ways of attaching to the body in various ways I could sort of frame the mask rather than obscuring it from view. You know, the mask is like the whole point. Um, and so anyway, so these pieces like asked a lot or as, as many questions as they answered for me, for sure. And um, I also think that making them maquettes also parallels the way that I'm thinking about this as like a political issue, uh, because obviously like part of the solution for this problem is we as individuals taking up individual mitigation efforts, but at its core, it's uh, an issue that requires significant intervention in terms of public health policy. And I believe the way for that to actually happen or for me to contribute to that is through collective organizing. And I'm thinking of this work for myself as like a statement of intent where I don't think that these pieces can be actually embodied and performed with the integrity at their full scale that they deserve without a commitment to 
specifically disability justice organizing. Um, and so, yeah, my goals moving forward are to move towards community care and take example from the organizers who are already mobilizing around disability justice work. And even since before the pandemic, like, there's so much grassroots stuff happening right now that, you know, it's not like building from the ground up. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. This is was really difficult work to make and to like think about and to talk about because again it's like this kind of sucks man <laughs> um but despite that I do feel really motivated to continue working in the studio after my residency um because outside of all this a big goal for me was to reconnect with making in general and to reconnect with the Georgia community that I really miss since like graduating from school um and I feel like I achieved that goal and I also, over here, a non-mask you may have noticed. Um, mm -hmm. I started production about, spin off. <laughs> yeah, I started thinking about making production work, which really hasn't been an interest of mine before. I made all this like big sculptural work, and I wasn't really making jewelry. Um, and and so but anyway, that's just something I'm really interested in. Those are obviously born out of all the research that I did, material research for these. Um. And so, yeah, I'm also really excited about that. And it, it definitely felt like an important, like, counterweight to sort of working through this heavy shit. Um, and I could just sort of make jewelry and, like, turn my brain off a little bit. So anyway, um, yeah, that's that's it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I'm gonna have to know if anyone would like is interested in any COVID resources, like hit me up. I can send you stuff. Like I know it's a lot, but yeah, yeah. Got my work cited in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eve, tell us if you would about uh blocking that you yeah. put on and uh some of the um uh, what are the materials exactly? And uh this is all original work on the plants, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so materials wise, I constructed these. I'm still working in like steel wire fabrication and um, I have all these spikes that I cast out of bronze. Um, and then while I was here, one of my classes at the jewelry center was um, a powder coating class with Molly Shulman. I'm trying and to get the sparkle of the, the texture. Yeah. It's so great. Um, and so yeah, it's, essentially um, powder coated steel and bronze. And then I considered with my displays, I was thinking about like putting them in drag and like really tuning them up and like getting them lashes and stuff. And like thinking, wait, I'm not gonna waste. So, but I figured that would be a little distracting. Um, and so I I went with just like having them be blocked and I'm and are the heads stock or did you no? I I did well? I did sculpt them. Oh, cool! Oh, neat. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, if you guys want to like get closer, through, yeah. get closer to this, I have to say, after like sitting back there with you and seeing you working on these, um. I, it just makes me so happy that you blocked them bright pink. Yeah, because that's totally. so you. Yeah, I know because it, it felt weird to like. I feel like I normally work in a lot of bright colors. Yeah, when I work when I'm incorporating sort of alternate materials. But for these, I don't know. This felt right. But I'm glad that this element ties it all together. So I think. I mean, even though obviously these are maquettes, I think it's really interesting that you took a thing that you had done like large scale. You'd been making masks and like big wearable things and made it again but in a small form so yeah. even that is sort of a, a new totally. direction to explore and that's been a really like when i feel like whenever i've been feeling stuck in the past having that like dynamic shift in scale has been very important for like working through different forms and like looking at them in different ways so yeah so it's a, it's a 360 headpiece, and, and, and I'm being dead, as you know, and I, this is not a plan. I, I'm very interested. Uh, <laughs> you're just from the family, and I can't uh, draw a straight line. But is, is this meant to be an indictment or a reflection of, of an armor of sorts or a protection? What's the interpretation that you would give that? Yeah. Art is 
saying most of these media and whatever you, whatever the message people take from it is, is good. But Sounds like you know your way around. Uh, I try. So what, what's your interpretation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I definitely, I mean, I, I definitely think they re reflect sort of the like, I don't know, it's like, it's it's hard. Like it's a really hard thing to like think about and make work about for me at least, and then we'll talk about it. Um, so they're definitely kind of like aggressive in a way that I think is like reflecting some of the like anger that I was feeling. I am. Um, but I also definitely see them as more so trying to. You said it like armor and like literally being able to have them highlight the mask and frame the mask and also. Um, yeah, like, uh, be literal protection where they're not disrupting or taking place of, you know, a, a respirator and they're not like a theoretical thing. It's like, you can wear it with PPE. It's like not going to interfere. I, I was just thinking like, I'm so glad that you made those. I mean, I know it's serious, but I have to say, yes, yeah. they're adorable. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, put masks on them because yeah. that just like, it really brings the point home. It really, like, the, it's the combination of the mask and the armor yeah. that um, I think really makes visual what you just described. It's perfect. <laughs> I'm glad. I know, because I um I was sculpting these things and I got really attached to their little faces, but I was like, <laughs> they gotta have, they gotta have the mask. It's yeah. important to get yeah. yeah. across. Well, it, it, like, actually makes the mask look cool. Yeah, I like, right now. It's what I was going for is that it's like how can I take this time and yeah I get it yeah I get it in there I can like cycle around um yeah, no, I'll, I'll cycle out yeah yeah how can, can we how can I take this around. thing that's like a medical device that also so many people have like trauma and like you know yeah, a okay. lot of baggage and we get well really cool like that was also like a major sort of game of mine um so I really like to um, you mentioned you know, at the beginning of your talk about um, like drag and yeah. mask as a political tool, and you yeah. also talk about the mask as like a uh, protective tool and a kind of armor. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering uh, how you think about like the relationship between uh, like political tools and masks and drag or maybe disguises more broadly. Mm -hmm. Like camouflage. Yeah, that's a good question. I just about that. Um yeah, I mean, I don't know if this answers your question, but I definitely think part of what I was sort of struggling with constantly while I was making this work was sort of the feeling of like making work about something where there's so much work to be done in the real world um and i don't know that is i don't know i feel like any like political part of it, it kind of comes back to that sometimes um but like you know would my energy be better used like you know organizing um but yeah i don't know if i answered your question but yeah i don't know i am um, yeah, well, that, I'm not about that one, but <laughs> so um, I, I actually work supporting a medical outfit, um, and so you know I'm not a doctor by any means, but uh, I hate to ask you this because it's a very difficult place to be in, but you feel somewhat vindicated now that the, the winter COVID respiratory you know trifecta has been so damaging to the population you feel like in some ways that your point of view is uh, now more valid than ever i do think that like a, like a couple months ago thinking about all this stuff versus sort of average public opinion it made me feel insane because it was so disparate of what the reality was versus what you know if you ask someone on the street street like what the deal is with covid it's, it was just like so absurd and I feel like now, obviously, it's not, I don't take any joy in knowing that people are suffering and sick. And, yeah, I, yeah. you know, but I do think that, like, I do think that public opinion, like, the reality of this is so huge that it can't 
be suppressed for that long. You know, it's like the truth will come out eventually. And um, I think that slowly that tide is turning. Like, I think that it's people are unable to ignore the fact that they get sick more often and that they feel tired and that they are unable to remember things that, the ways that they used to. And I think that, you know, obviously it's like really horrible, but also um, I do think that like, I'm seeing more and more people talking about it, which makes me feel good and makes me feel like less crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> Is there any other questions? Yeah. Good job. Really well done. <laughs> Thank you.